Hello, welcome to the next video in the virtual tour of the City of London Police Museum. Um, today uh, we're going to be talking about a particular object in the museum uh, known as a Wayweiser and some of the things that it was used for and um, its impact on the city. Uh, my name is Kim Bidolf and I'm joined by my colleagues Deborah Linton. Hello Debbie. Hi. And Martin Murta. Hi, how you doing? Hello, lovely. So let's let's uh, show you a picture of this Wayweiser, which is in our museum. So what is this Wayweiser, Debbie? OK, so obviously this is shown in the museum. It's a Wayweiser. Um, another name for it was a perambulator or a beat wheel, I think it was sometimes called. Um, and as you can see, it's got a large wooden frame with a big wheel and a silvered brass dial on it and this contraption was basically used to measure the police beat the length of the police beat so it has a dial on it on the large dial a hand that goes around that shows that a whole mile has been walked and then I think there's another smaller dial somewhere that shows a number of miles and um, I suppose you could say it was like a very old-fashioned pedometer so mm. um, it's quite an old invention, isn't it? It's an 18th century invention. I think Jonathan Sisson um, invented similar uh, contraptions. I don't know if this exact one, but um, he was the person behind it. And um, it was very important to know the exact length of the beat that police officers were walking. So... What they did was they divided up the city or any police force area into beat areas. We don't have them so much anymore. And um, I suppose back in those days, communications weren't like they are today. There wasn't any radio or anything like that. So if you measured the exact distance with the exact meeting point, you would know from when the police officer took off where he would be on that beat. And uh, there were very, very strict rules ar around the beat as well. And mm. also pe people in the community would know where they were as well. So if they knew they did a set route um, and it took a certain amount of time, they could call upon the police officer if there was a problem. And he So this was the that. early version of 999, wasn't it? You, you would just go out on the street and wait for a police officer to come past on the beat. Exactly, yeah. You'd be able to... to to get, get hold of him and, and speak to him and he'd also get to know his beat quite well so he'd get to know the people on it he'd get to know the buildings on it and then he'd notice something that was unusual on the beat yeah absolutely um i know that we have a police historian who's told us he was in the city police for nearly 40 years and remembers going out on the beat um, and um, particularly at night time, looking at making sure that the buildings are all secure um, and uh, seeing if, it, if there was anything that was going on. And some of the beats were a little bit more, um, uh, the, there were good beats and there were bad beats, weren't there, <laughs> basically? That's right. I think he mentions one on Tower Bridge that was particularly, especially in the winter, you know, they just walked up and down, up and down Tower Bridge and um, there wasn't much shelter and it was just a very monotonous, boring beat that apparently some sergeants would put police officers on as a punishment. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, it's such a shame. Um, there, the handbook, well, as you say, there were quite a few rules about what people could and couldn't do, weren't there? There were very strict rules. So if I read out, uh, we, we could all take this in turns, actually. There are some rules from 19th century city police handbook here that say what they can and cannot do whilst they're on the beat. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I read out says um, this is the instruction to the police officer he will be expected to possess such a knowledge of the inhabitants of each house as will enable him to recognize their persons so he'll get to know everyone on the beat he will thus prevent mistakes and be enabled to render assistance to the inhabitants when called for so he'll get to know the people on his beat 
Do you want us to read the, shall I? If you do the next one, Kim. Yeah, he should traverse every part of his beat in the time prescribed in the rules to be seen at the station house and at the chief office. And this he will be expected to do regularly so that any person requiring assistance by remaining in the same spot for that length of time may be able to meet a constable. And the oh, sorry. Thanks, yes, Martin, if you read the, the last yeah, one. Yeah, this is the final one. Um, this regularity of moving through his beach shall not, however, prevent his remaining at any particular place. If his presence there be necessary to observe the conduct of any suspected person or for any other good purpose, but he will be required to satisfy, satisfy his sergeant or superior officer that there was a sufficient cause for such. So there were reprimands, weren't there? If they were, if, if they were not found at a particular point on their beat, um, that was punishable. They they had to be. They, they weren't supposed to leave their beat um, for anything except maybe a fire or an emergency. And even after that, when they went to to help a police officer on another beat, they had to go straight back to their beat again. So um, I think they were supposed to walk at a pace of something like two and a half miles per hour and walk in an upright fashion they were supposed to there were day beats and night beats and they were supposed to walk along the curb during the day so that they were easily seen um, and they could see what was happening as well and then at night they were supposed to walk more in the shadows along the side of the buildings and we've come to that in a little bit about the, the lantern that they held that had little shutter that they put down but um, they were supposed to be sort of very discreet and they, they weren't supposed to interfere too much as well so they weren't supposed to dawdle or chat to the community too much and they were just supposed to be sort of the eyes and ears and be seen. And um, the uh, George Belay's child, actually, who, who we talk about in another video, um, did suggest that they could walk up to 16 miles per shift, didn't he? So it was a, quite a, it, it was just a very relentless to keep on walking and walking and walking. It would have been, yeah. Um, the beat then was um, was intended to make it easy for communication and easy to find a police officer but having that regular beat where you could you know where the police officer is all the time could have its downsides as well, couldn't it? That's right. I mean, I suppose the other side of the, the, the picture is that you knew when the police officer had walked by that you wouldn't see them again for a certain amount of time or you might know when to expect them to come by. Um, and this and yeah. map is from the one of those times um, in 1888, isn't it? So one of the case studies in the uh, museum is that one of the victims of so-called uh, the serial killer Jack the Ripper, one the fourth the fourth victim, Catherine Edo, sadly, she was the only victim to be killed in the city, wasn't she? Yeah. Um, the rest was in the Metropolitan Police District. But um, this, we, we have a, a picture up in the museum that shows the beats that evening. That's why it's relevant to, to talking about the police beats here. So, um, yeah, we have uh, the, the solid line going round shows the beat of PC Harvey on the evening of her uh, death um, in the 30th of September, 1888. And alongside that, we have in the dotted line, you can see PC Watkins beat and then the location where her body was found. And we also find out from the inquest that their beat took them about 15 minutes to walk, didn't they? That's right. And I think PC Watkins reported nothing particular that was unusual that evening. You know, um, it was poorly lit, he said. Um, he saw a few residents, not many, but there wasn't anything particular to to note. I yes, think. so he went, he must have gone through Mitre Square at 1.30-ish, and then he was back by 1.45, and that's when he found Catherine Eddowes. And you can see also PC Harvey went down the alleyway all, all the way to the edge of Mitre Square, um, and apparently, I think he was there sometime between 1.30 and one. 45 in the morning and still he didn't see anything either so 
having these beats meant that people could um, could also watch the police and easily avoid them, I guess. Do you think, Martin? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, so basically, you know, criminals will know where, <laughs> where the police were and uh, they could avoid them. Um, yeah. But I think the, the, the other important thing here is that, you know, you've got these two adjacent wards or beats. So the officers on the beat would know where their colleague would be at any one time. If they yeah, there were several help. points where they could meet, weren't there? Yeah. Um, the commissioner at the time, um, Henry Smith, I think he was acting commissioner, actually, um, he um, he wasn't very happy with uh, with his police officers, was he? Debbie. No, I think he was personally disappointed that that one of the victims had died in the city mm. because he had put in various operational strategies to try and avoid it. So, um, for example, earlier that evening, she had been arrested. Um, well, not arrested, she'd been put in a police cell, hadn't she, in Bishopsgate Police Station mm. um, for her own protection because she was found to be maybe a bit over, you know, had too much alcohol, but they'd had to release her at about 1am because of overcrowding. So only about 45 minutes later, she was found at this spot, you know, having died. So it wasn't, you know, Bishopsgate Police Station was only 10 minutes north of here, wasn't it? It wasn't terribly far away. Mm. So she had been, you know, they had tried to and... Um, yeah, I mean, I think we were saying that in his autobiography, he, he felt that if everything had been followed according to the beats and everything that he had recommended, that he felt that this wouldn't have happened. Yes, um, but we wonder how much he's passing the buck at that point, don't we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, there were because he'd put planes clo plain clothes patrols out as well. Um, and uh, they did stop several people that night, but apparently all of them could account for their whereabouts. So, um, yes, uh, again, the Whitechapel murderer uh, got away. Um, uh, you meant, uh, Martin, you mentioned a little bit about communication because um, what happened here was that um, PC Watkins, who found the, um, the body of Catherine Eddowes, <clears throat> didn't um have a whistle at this point um and he it seems like I, I don't know from the inquest it seems like he also didn't have um the precursor to the whistle either uh, so, so these are yeah sorry go on no no so what we see here is the the the, the rattle um and this had a it had a dual purpose so it was a sort of communications for those of a certain age may remember at football matches people would have these and they would uh, rattle them and they'd make this rattling <laughs> rattling sound yeah. um and it was eventually placed replaced by the whistle so this was a really really early form of communications um and when the whistle replaced the rattle um, the police officers weren't that happy because of that always said it had dual purpose. It was a communication tool. It made a, 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 a very loud noise. So your, um, uh, your colleague on the adjacent beat would know that he was in trouble and you may need assistance. Um, but it could also be used as a weapon. So it was a, that protective mechanism as well for the police force. So as I said, they weren't too happy when the whistle came along because all that would do is um, just you know, say that you needed help and couldn't be used as a weapon in any form. But it seems like it might have been a transitional period because the whistle was actually, um, I think it was patented earlier in the 1880s, but it wasn't official um, police um, yeah. uniform, or not, not uniform, equipment until 1889. So, um, so when Watkins uh, found the body it was actually a former police officer who is now a security guard at Curly and Tongs, Keely and Tongs on the um, warehouse on Mitre Square who actually went off and found somebody and he he blew his whistle. Oh. Um, they had other equipment as well didn't they Debbie that just here I can point it out uh, well, this got, case yeah. have got quite a lot of stuff in but obviously there's a couple of bits of important equipment. Well, this shows lots of things actually a lot of it was relate in relation to specials as well but and sort of interwar years but there's a there's a truncheon there isn't there yeah 
Uh, that's on display in the museum very old truncheon mm. and um also there's a lantern there i think yeah. that's a 1940s one it's quite interesting because it's it's got a little cap over the light tilting it downwards yeah for blackout purposes yeah exactly to keep the light low um but one of the interesting things about the old night beats that police officers used to do they didn't have this lantern obviously in the 18th century but they did have a little lantern and if like I said they were supposed to patrol close to the buildings not on the curb not to be seen easily and if they did see something they were supposed to let this little um, shutter on the lantern come down so that they could just be discreet and not seen and observe what was going on mm. hiding in the shadows and watching and the other bit of equipment that's really important as well um, is the this red and white band on the um, the tunic sleeve, wasn't it? Yes, absolutely. So we mentioned this in, in other videos as well. So that was the duty band, wasn't it? So when police officers were on duty, they had to wear their duty bands so that members of the public knew that they were working basically so that they could ask for their assistance because officers were meant to go to work and and come back from work in uniform um so they had to wear the duty band to show the public when they were actually when they could be approached yes yeah, especially in the early years so it, the, the government was very keen that they weren't seen as spies of the government so everybody knew who they were whether they're on duty or off duty but the, the duty band yeah they would have worn on on patrol and um the beat is something that that uh, is consistently shown to be something people want back isn't it it is. I mean, all public surveys on the police, time and time again, when we ask for opinions on uh, the police service and what people want from police ser the ser service, they always ask for more reassurance. And that always comes from asking for more so-called bobbies on the beat. Mm. Um, and I sort of go with that, actually. But um, there was a resurgence of it from about 2000. Sadly, it's 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 changed again recently. Um, but under the Police Reform Act in 2002, remember that we introduced PCSOs, Police Community Support Officers. They don't have the same yeah. powers as police officers, but it was, again, trying to increase the number of patrols and perhaps having a less reactive response with better communications and being in cars and being more proactive again and getting to know communities. So and preventative as well. Wasn't it going back to the early police principles, policing principles? It was about that preventative um, aspect of having the bobby on the beat. What do you think, Martin? Do you think we should have more bobbies on the beat? Uh, I, yeah, I actually do. <laughs> so um, it's very popular. And, uh, yeah, and there's, uh, I, I think people um, feel more reassured um, knowing that you know there are policemen patrolling. I suppose it's like you know how effective or efficient is it? You know, do you actually need to have them walking? Can you have them patrolling in cars? So, but I do think it does give that that um, reassurance to the public, um, and also getting to know their local policeman or policewoman um, as well, and building up that rapport and, and relationship. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, there you go. That we this all this discussion all came out of looking at the Wayweiser. If I just hop back to that, I should have put another one in. Um, this uh, uh, old system of measuring the city and measuring the beats um, was very important and was used up until the 1940s as well. Um, but there you go. Thank you very much for watching and look out for our next instalment of the virtual tour of the museum. Thank you very much, Martin and Debbie. Thank you. Thank you.